We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. I'm your host, Yue Shu, former dating coach turned a dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host, Julie Kraftchik. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. We are excited you've joined us for an older episode. While our earlier seasons were all about dating in San Francisco, we quickly realized all the themes and learnings are universal for all daters. So we shifted to covering dating from all around the world as the seasons progress. The fun part is things happen first in San Francisco, the tech epicenter and counterculture capital of the world. We love for you to keep tuning in to our older episodes, but there is no set order to listen in. So feel free to jump to more recent seasons or relevant episodes for you. Enjoy the show. I was so excited to get my shipment from Last Bottle Wines in the mail the other day full of incredible red wines all from Napa Valley. I love wine tasting, so having this to my door couldn't be happier. Also couldn't be more excited that today's episode is brought to you by Last Bottle Wines. If you don't know already, they're a Napa-based online wine shop with a twist. They offer just one hand-picked wine per day until it sells out, and they're always at incredible prices. We're talking talking 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part is that there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase. And I could not be more excited to bring this offer right now because they're having a marathon sale, which is coming up March 28th and 29th. Even better, we're offering Dateable listeners 10% off your first order with code Dateable. So if you are a wine lover like me, this is a great time to join. And did I mention that shipping is 100% free? So so what are you waiting for? Mark your calendar for March 28th and 29th or get on it earlier if you want. You can sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use code DATEABLE and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. This episode of Dateable is brought to you by 500 Brunches. Meet like-minded people who share your interests over brunch. So for this episode, both Michael and I were traveling and we had no sound equipment. So please excuse the sound quality, but I promise you this is a good one. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Dateable, a show that opens a candid conversation about dating in San Francisco. And um, the male voice you just heard comes from Michael Vargas. The woman who just did a lovely, lovely introduction to me is our friend UA. So on each episode, we dissect a dating story. So on the phone right now, we have John. John, are you there? Hey, guys. Yep. Thanks for having me on. What is your story? Um, this happened to me a little while ago. It's been a bit. But um, I had just gotten out of a pretty interesting, pretty intense relationship. And um, I was actually hanging out at my office one day. And it was, a, it was a collaborative working space, another San Francisco thing. And a really good friend of mine in the office had a bunch of her girlfriends over sort of just hanging out one day. One of her friends happened to be a matchmaker. So I started talking to the matchmaker. She starts asking me about the type, types of women that I like, et cetera, asking me specific questions like, 
tall, short, smart, funny, quiet? Do I like girls that read a lot, et cetera? So she described this, this woman that I was, you know, it sounded like I would be attracted to. And so I was like, yep, super into it. I'm thinking, you know, this is amazing. I've gotten out of this relationship and now I have a friend literally hooking me up with a matchmaker to go on a date. Now, think about this. Most people think about matchmakers in terms of, oh, I'm going to go hire a matchmaker because I want to get married or I want to find a serious relationship. And I, and I can see that happening in San Francisco a lot because it's easy to date people and it's easy to sleep with people, but it's hard to like find a, a stable long-term relationship or find somebody that you want to marry. For whatever reason, there's something in the water, something about the hippie culture in San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> Commitment is just not a thing that people usually go for. Um, mm -hmm. So it didn't really surprise me that, that you know, that there was a, a matchmaker doing business here. What was funny about it was I was on the un other end of the interaction, right? So somebody had paid this woman money to, you know, set her up on dates. And here I was um, in the process of being set up on one of these dates. So um, we're talking about, we're talking about the woman that she's going to, she's going to introduce me to. And then she asked the question, she's like, how do you feel about older women? And she's like, oh, she's 36, 37. Now I'm, you know, I'm still under 30. So I'm sitting here thinking, and I told her straight up, I'm like, listen, that's a big age jump for me right now. And I know what somebody at that stage of their life is after. And that's probably not me. I'd love to go out on a date with them but it'll probably be casual. So I just want to tell you right now, I wanted to set expectations. Like um, if, if this person's looking for something very serious, then I'm not going to be the, the right thing for them. You know, because I didn't want her, you know, it's like, this is her business. This is also somebody on the other end of the, the equation. So I get the phone number um, and, and, and I call her, I call, you know, I call the girl that I'm going to set up on a date with and, and we agree to go out. Um, you know, 20, 30 minutes into the day, you know, we're attracted to each other. She's beautiful. You know, I'm kind of into it, but I can already start to feel like, oh, I don't know how, how far this is going to go. Sometimes when you go on that, like on a first date, you can kind of tell like there's no magic here. Um, mm -hmm. there was chemistry, but you know, like I knew that it wasn't going to be like a long-term thing. And, um, you know, I'm start I'm asking her about, you know, what she's into and all this stuff. And she's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm really looking for a serious relationship. Um, I'd like to find somebody to settle down with. She was telling me about her dog. It was a super cute conversation. Um, but the chemistry starts to happen, right? So, you know, after a little bit, I, I just looked her straight in the eyes and I'm like, I think I'm probably going to make out with you tonight. And she like, you know, her face lights up and, and she goes, oh. and, uh, and we still had a little bit left in our drinks. So, you know, things are going on, we're on the second or third or fourth drink, whatever. And, and I said, we'll have to wait till I leave the, we'll have to wait till we leave the bar. And she looks at me and goes, oh, why wait? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. so, so we end up like immediately. So we're, now we're making out at the bar. We went out on another date or two, um, but that was really the end of it. I, I got to ask, you know, I heard a couple more dates and it ended, but. You got anything else about how it ended or just kind of like, did you guys ghost? Did you guys say, Hey, I'm done. I'm looking for something more. Like how did that part end? So a couple of things happened. We, we, we went to a bar. We went, we went out near her apartment, which is in a different er area of San Francisco, which is also a big deal. If you live here going to a different neighborhood. Um, and I was sick. Right. So like, I was even like trying to beg off for the day. I'm like, listen, I'm, you know, I've got a cold. I don't want to get you sick. And she's like, no, I want to see you. I want to see you. So I'm like, okay, fine. We'll do this. I don't want to drink tonight. Let's just go eat some like super spicy Asian food somewhere awesome. And then, you know, whatever. And so, so she's like, cool, cool. I get it. Um, she made some joke about giving me her hot toddy. And then um, an hour before the date, she's like, Hey, meet me at this bar. So I meet her at the bar. We have a couple of drinks. I should have just like, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have had any alcohol because I didn't eat it. Um, we went to dinner and then I woke up the next morning and thought, this is just not how I want to be spending my time. So yes, I ghosted. Ah, ah boo. <laughs> well, it is a, I've heard many a ghosting story. So that's, that, I mean, we even have a term for it, ghosting, right? So I have a question. Um, if you didn't know her age before going into the date, do you think your interaction would have been different? 
So it was like maybe like a five to eight year difference. Uh, yeah, but it's like, it's a pretty important five to eight years, you know? Like if it had been the other way around, if like I'd been, you know, in my late, in my mid to late thirties, that, that's a little bit different. But like a woman who's that age, like she has serious, like there's only a few more years that if she wants to have kids, she's really going to like be able to do that. Um, you know, unless she's frozen her eggs or something like that. And I really wanted to take that seriously because that's her life and her family that we're talking about there. And I don't want to waste anybody's time if that's what they need to do next. I would love to hear from you, UA, about this, because this isn't the first time I've heard guys talk about this where they don't want to, where they're not in a space to commit. So they don't want to really progress a relationship with a woman who's older who maybe wants to have kids or whatnot. I'm curious as to what are your thoughts about that? So first of all, I think what's misleading is um, age, because I think it's really about life stage. And I wish that we could uh, we could judge each other better based on life stage instead of age. Now, my yep. other issue, not issue, but I find this interesting, is that we've talked to people, men, who prefer dating older women, but older meaning in their 40s. So something happens between 30 to 40 where if you date a woman in their 30s, in her 30s, it's more sensitive because that's her fertile period. She can still, she may still want kids. She may still want a family. She may still want to hurry things up. But something, a switch must turn on or off when she's in her 40s because we've had younger guys who tell us that women in their 40s, uh, they're less maintenance because they're more like fuck it attitude. So they're just much easier to date. I think that's a part of it. And also, I think women at that age, they're more confident in themselves. They're more kind of know what they want for their lives. So they also have that mentality of like, hey, this is where I'm at. That confidence probably comes from they ha- they don't have anything to lose anymore, you know, along, along lines of having kids or not. Like they know where they're at and they can focus more on just themselves and having a good time and enjoying work, enjoying life enjoying the company of somebody, whether that's a younger man or not. So there is this issue of the biological clock, and I felt it the minute I turned 30. I've had five friends who have frozen their eggs in the last year, and all of them across the board have told me dating is so much more fun after they froze their eggs, and they don't feel like they're trying to find a, a husband or a dad or a baby daddy. They're trying to just have fun with dating. So that biological clock is definitely ticking, and we feel it. I've heard, I've heard, uh, it's weird because in one week I heard three women like turning in their thirties saying that they're craving babies. No, <laughs> like, I'm have, well, craving ice cream today and maybe baby. They're craving having babies. Has, has anyone else heard that of other people like craving to like have a baby? Yeah. I've heard girlfriends say that. Definitely. How do you get that craving? That's my question. Like, how do you all of a sudden you're like, I think I want to be a mom, but John, back to your story. Um, something about you being aware of her age probably made some of her actions more amplified. And the irony of this is like, so here's what's, here's what's ironic about it. Like if if a girl in her twenties had done that, I would have thought something like, Oh my God, this girl's like dramatic or she's going to be high maintenance. Like, you know, you, you look at how much time has elapsed in a relationship or like when you're, when you start dating a girl and like how much drama like starts cropping up and that's sort of like a leading indicator of how much drama the relationship's actually going to be. Uh, my my limited several years experience of San Francisco dating is um, it's been easier to have sex with someone in this city more than any other city. Very easy. And it's also been harder to develop a emotional intimacy with someone. Yeah, the most successful I- relationships that I've had in this city have come from people who didn't live here or who had just moved here. Yeah. We talked about importing them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be a great – that is the next dating service is importing. No, so, uh, my, my, we can make I, I dated a girl for about a year here that I, you know, that I quote, unquote, imported from, from my home state. Um, <laughs> I didn't know her when she was there, but, but she knew me because of some stuff that, that I'd written um, and found me here, and, and we started dating. But it was like I was her first San Francisco boyfriend. So – I'm struggling with this because this whole idea of having casual sex is so easy in San Francisco. 
I think that's across the board in any big city where you have a high concentration of young people. It's like going to uh, summer camp. Everyone's just going to be fucking all the time. Now that's, the that's is, their tagline. That's the summer camp's tagline is, have fun at Camp Foggy and we're fucking all week. <laughs> so the thing is like, okay, so people have to get over that initial, uh, that initial pleasure from getting really easy casual sex. And then they start wanting something more because they're nearing another life stage. They're approaching this life stage of being like, I just want something more stable and serious. So I think that the issue we're facing in San Francisco, which may be unique to San Francisco, is getting over that hump, going from casual to something more substantial. What if we just don't have sex for like the first several months? We go back, go, you know, on our time machine where they didn't have sex right away and we wait a little bit and actually, you know, court each other. Oh, you'd watch relationships, you'd watch relationships increase really, really quickly. Like the the way that works is girls say, oh, we can't have sex until like we have a commitment. And then all of a sudden guys left and right are like trying to commit to women because we really like having sex. I mean, you, 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 I mean, that's part of the reason that, you know, you like traditional societies and like religions have always placed sex behind marriage is because it stabilizes everybody. It's like you get pair bonded to one person and then you start a family. And like, if you're a dude and you have a wife, like other men can attest to this. Like guys only start getting serious with a woman. It changes the, like the shape of our life. We spend our money differently. We think about work differently. Like all of a sudden we're not just thinking about us and beer and video games and porn and whatever. Like we're thinking about, um, caring for other people and it shifts our focus in life. But that doesn't happen in San Francisco because nobody actually figures they're going to stay here very long. The Peter Pan syndrome that we have here, I think is a, is caused in a lot of ways because it's a city of like transients. We come here like hoping to strike it rich or hoping for adventure or hoping to open our horizons and then go back somewhere else. But because nobody's necessarily committed to San Francisco or in the back of their minds, they know at some point their rent's going to get raised and they may not be be able to afford to live here anymore because of all that nobody has really really like um deep roots in san francisco and so we don't have deep roots to each other either and so absent those like deep roots or those deep connections we'll take what we can get which is casual sex with people that we like and we like having in our lives but we don't take it that personally if they disappear on us but this is a worldwide issue which is these cities like San Francisco, New York, LA, it attracts transients. And it also attracts a certain caliber of people who go and try to pursue their dreams. So that's why we find more attraction in these cities because we're finding like-minded people. Yeah, it's like we're fucking ourselves. We are fucking, like, like, maybe that's the future. We just fuck ourselves. That's it. You, you just went to CES. You saw some virtual reality. So I think that's not too far away. Oh, no, people are definitely fucking themselves or fucking machines. That's what we're doing now. <laughs> let's, not put, let's not put we in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready for that commitment. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> so Michael, I want to go back to you. Michael, I want to go back to your proposition of saying, what if we just spent a few weeks or a few months courting each other and then we have sex? So this has personally happened to me and a few friends of mine where we tried that, you know, we held up on sex. We really wanted to get to know the guy. A few months go by, we decide to have sex and the sex is terrible. And that's when you go, yeah, this is not going to work out. But so, you, uh, can't, you tell that after, can't you tell that after you kiss somebody though? Like, haven't you noticed no. the relation between a good, good kisser and good sex? No, no, there's not. Uh, there should be a correlation, but it's not always apparent. I'm going to chime in here. There. I agree with you. I definitely not from a female perspective. Interesting. Thanks, Julie. I, I think, yeah. I do think, um, I like, I've definitely had hit or miss with good kisses, but what I will say is um, if our bodies kind of like each other. So I know that sounds kind of weird, but uh, like if I find, if I have a partner that I dance with a lot, and we dance really well together, that is generally correlated to good sex. Like, uh, so okay. it's not just like the kissing, it's 
to our, like, okay, we have our, you know, we have, we get in the flow of each other mentally, right? And I think we can understand that physically without sex. And I think dance is one of the ways that you can kind of discover that. I'm not sure what other ways, but um, I think that's a good indicator of good sex with a person or not. My, so my last food for thought for everyone, because I'm thinking about this as we go along, are we placing too much emphasis on sex? Because if you look at the old ways of courtship, sex was never an emphasis. It's kind of the cherry on top. It's a nice to have. But nowadays, you open up any magazine or get a quote from any relationship counselor. They always say sex life is the most important part of your relationship. If your sex life starts failing, your relationship will start failing. Is this just propaganda, maybe, to open up a whole market for, like, sexual activity? Is sex being commercialized? To a point where it's actually harming us. I, I think, I think in many ways it absolutely is, and I also do think uh, because it's giving us a slice of the pie, a piece of the puzzle, right? There's so many more elements that are associated with having a wonderful relationship, and I think sex is important. I don't think it's the most important by any means, and I think that we can also find ways of having better sex with our partner if we open up communication more. Because the, the thing is, with, I believe, with good sex is a lot of communication. Um, you know, verbal communication, also um, body language and all that stuff. But I think if we learn to communicate with each other better, I think our sex can get better. I agree with you a lot about communication. And I would add on to that. I would, I would say that um, I've noticed that sex life is usually, court, like, sex is, is not the cause all the time or usually. A lot of times, like, have, like feeling connected um, feeling the intimacy because that's a lot of what comes from sex is the connection and the like, you know, you're joining one another in those moments that like when something's off sexually, that's usually an indicator that something else is wrong in the relationship. Um, and that's, that's like the, the thing that's like, okay, we're not connecting physically. There's something emotionally that we're disjointed on and we need to communicate for a minute. We need to figure out like, did I do something that hurt your feelings? Are you upset at work? Um, have I not been paying enough attention to you? What are we missing here? And you find those things out. And in the process, like the bad sex or the no sex is like, it's like this trigger that says, Hey, something's up. And then it's also the care that they're taking to fix it. So you can get laid again. All right. So I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, do we have any takeaways Some takeaways from this conversation? My takeaway is one is, Life stage match is so important, so we should kind of throw age out the door, but when we're on the first date and we're trying to figure out if we're a match for each other, I think discussing life stage is more important. Um, my second takeaway is, this is what I'm learning from John, sex is a product of communication. So if your communication's off, if your connection's off, then sex is probably going to be off. So sex is a good indicator of how you're communicating with each other. I think it's really important to really listen and give ourselves space to listen for a period of time before we have that leap of intimacy of sex. Uh, I think it's, it's good to get to know each other, to also learn each other about mentally, emotionally, physically, without having sex. And I think personally that helps kind of dive into the relationship. Uh, so now it's the time for question of the day. And we have a question from a listener, Paul Boone. So Paul Boone writes, what is the most effective way of starting to date someone? And I think this is an awesome question because there's so many ways out there, right? Versus matchmakers, going online, meeting in person, friends, coworkers, all that stuff. So uh, you ate, would you like to, do you have any thoughts on that? In my case, personally speaking, um, increasing the frequency of seeing someone. So it's much harder for me to have attraction with someone that I meet for the first time versus someone that I see all the time. So might that be a coworker or, um, someone I go hiking with in a hiking club or group, just FaceTime, consistent FaceTime. And, and for me, I will actually have to agree on that one. I, I love the idea of, of going out, meeting people face-to-face, -face, getting to know people, and then starting to uh, to start 
Oh, okay, I'm connecting with this person. Let me talk to them more. Oh, we're connecting more. Let's talk even further. I think it just depends on your personal style, how attraction builds for you. So I guess the the real answer to that question is find what works for you. Try as many different ways of dating as possible. I think just expanding your network, which is hence our sponsor, 500 Brunches, the perfect tie-in, but you never know who you'll just meet or even their friend's friend. So very good point. The more people you know, the higher your chances of meeting the love of life. Boom. So people go meet people so that you can get more people. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. If you're listening, don't forget you can submit your stories and we can always keep you anonymous, change your name, change the names of the people involved in your story. And last but not least, Michael. Stay dateable. The Dateable Podcast is recorded in San Francisco. We would like to thank our sponsor, 500 Brunches, for making this happen. To connect with us, visit dateablepodcast.com. Mm-hmm.